And I think we're going to get, I think we're going to get started. Um, uh, as I was just saying previously, I've got a bit of an introduction to do just about IALA UK. Um, so people can continue to join while I do this. So just to say hello and welcome to this special edition of our IALA UK webinar series, Landscape Connections. I'm Chloe Bellamy. Um, I work for Forest Research and I'm part of the IALA UK committee. So for those of you who are new to IALA UK, we are the UK chapter of the International Association for Landscape Ecology, and we are part of a global community of researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and others whose work and interests lie in the social and ecological dynamics of the landscape. And we're actually one of the longest running chapters of IALA, um, having run for around 28 years now. And our beginnings were in part thanks to one of our founding members, the late Bob Bunce. Um, who made outstanding contributions to um, the field of landscape ecology and the community as well um, throughout his long career. So in September, uh, IRL UK uh, ran a one-off Bunt Symposium with CEH, and this was to celebrate his work and his life. And we've also set up this annual Bunt's Lecture in his memory. So each year we plan to honour him by inviting speakers to talk about exciting and topical issues in the field of landscape ecology. So Vanessa, if you could just move to the next slide, please. Um, so today I'm delighted to welcome uh, Keith Kirby uh, to talk about what woodland conservation and restoration mean in the 21st century. I'm also pleased to say we have a brilliant uh, discussion panel from around the UK to respond to Keith's talk. So we have Emma Goldberg from Natural England, Kirsty Park from the University of Stirling, Jim Latham from Natural Resources Wales, and Nina Schonberg from Northern Ireland Landscape Partnership. Um, so following this, uh, the panel discussion, uh, you'll then have a chance to ask questions. So during this whole session, feel free to use the chat function to write questions throughout the event, and we can either read these out um, or unmute you during the Q&A session. Um, and then the Q&A session is going to finish just before five. Uh, we're going to have a short comfort break. And then for those of you who are interested, and we encourage as many of you as possible, particularly members and those who would like to be members, uh, to stay on for our IALA UK AGM, uh, where we're going to be electing our new committee members. So now, can I just check we've got Jeff here? Jeff, breathless. Chloe, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'll thank be. you. Um, so yeah. Jeff, I'm just going to pass you over to Jeff, who's going to introduce Keith. Thanks. Okay. Ah, oh, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first. Um, Landscape Connections Bob Bunce Memorial Lecture. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Keith Kirby as our keynote speaker. Um, and this is to be followed by a panel discussion and for IOLA UK members, as you've already learned, the AGM. So we encourage you to stay on if you possibly can. Just to introduce um, Keith, and it's a great pleasure to have him with us this afternoon. Um, Keith started life as an Oxford forester progressing on to a long career with the Nature Conservancy Council, latterly Natural England, until his formal, formal retirement in 2012. Keith's now a research fellow in the Department of Plant Sciences at Oxford and continues to publish both in the peer-reviewed literature and more widely read publications, such as British Wildlife, where I'm sure you will have seen recent articles by him. So he's going to talk to us today about his long-term interest in the British, in British woodlands at a time when they're undergoing rapid change and facing significant threats. So welcome, Keith, over to you. Thank you on behalf of IALA UK for agreeing to, to um, be the keynote speecher, speaker this afternoon at, at this very important uh, event, the, the first Bob Bunce Memorial Lecture. Keith, over to you, thank you. Thank you. What Jeff didn't say was that, of course, um, the other connection between us is that we're both Morris dancers. And I seem to recall this 
uh, the invitation came at the end of one practice session. <laughs> I was obviously just too exhausted. <laughs> I was I was studiously ex ignoring that, uh, Keith, but uh, I'm glad you've mentioned it. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Right. I hope that the slides, uh, that slide is visible. So um, what I want to reflect on is where woodland conservation and restoration are going in the 21st century. And I'll start by saying that um, my brother had four kids, so I've got a lot of experience of being an uncle. And uncles, being an uncle is great. You indulge them, you sort of have fun with them, and then you hand them back at the end of the day, and somebody else, the parents, has to take all the consequences. Well, this talk is going to be a bit like that. I'm going to float some ideas which I think are quite interesting, and I hope you will too. But it's you that are going to have to face the consequences of my ramblings, um, because as Jeff has said, I'm retired. So I think let's go back to when I started in a way. It was a very different world in the 1970s. And my first job was as a phase one woodland surveyor in the Lake District. And I was instructed by Bob, uh, though I was actually working for the Lake District Planning Board. You've got to remember this is before satellite imagery, only small scale and out of date aerial photography, usually about 10 or 15 years out of date. But at the same time, a period of very active landscape change through coniferization and afforestation. But the way we did this phase one survey, which was mimicking uh, the work that Bob had done on broadleaf woods in Scotland was to just drive along roads, in my case on a Honda C90 moped, uh, with a clipboard and a pair of binoculars scanning the hillsides and trying to decide whether the wood was still there, if it was broadleaf, and if you could, some idea as to its composition. So, you know, looking up, dark green with grey splodges coming down the hillside, ah, probably oak with ash along the stream sides. I suspect my survey was nowhere near as good as Bob's surveys in Scotland, but hey, it got me a bit of experience and introduced me to the Nature Conservancy Council. Um, that was one of my first encounters with Bob. And the other real big time when we worked a lot together as opposed to just sort of meeting up for a pint at some stage or other in some conference or wood was with the National Woodland Survey in 2001 where we were trying, as Bob's idea was to resurvey a hundred woods which he had looked at in the, with Wally Shaw in the 1970s and to then look at the change and try to um, determine what was driving those changes. And we came up with, um, uh, first of all, getting the consortium of bodies to put the money together and then look at the results. And these were some of the sort of changes that we saw that we thought we could identify. And it will be interesting to see whether the um, further resurvey that is going on at present, organised by the Woodland Trust, um, adds to the complexity of this sort of network of drivers of change. Um, and the reason for introducing those two elements is in a way they, they sum up a lot of what Bob was about. He was about looking at large scale uh, processes on a landscape scale before the really the term landscape ecology really existed and looking at change over time and the value of taking long-term results and then repeating them and i think that's that's something that was well ahead of his time really but that was 40 50 years ago when we could probably count on a, a relatively stable climate. 
if anyone was talking about climate change, it was probably about the risks of us going into the next glaciation. Um, pollution, mm, yeah, was a bit of a problem, but mainly to do with pesticides, not something that was particularly in the atmosphere. Whereas now in the 2020s, we're heading into the unknown as far as atmospheric conditions are concerned and changing climate. And it seems to me that in the conservation sector, we're very good at telling people in farming, forestry, industry, how they should be changing the way they're doing things to plan for these new conditions. But they've got to be radical. They've got to change crops. They've got to change the way they do things. But are we really as radical when we're looking at how we do conservation? And that's something I wonder about. Um, I don't know whether anyone has any picked any opinions on the three slides below, but one is a, a home oak stand. I would say it's probably a reasonably good semi-natural home oak stand, which if it was in a bit further south in Europe, we would be concerned to conserve. It's actually in Dorset. Um, there's a rather nice stand in the middle of um, some old beach, veteran beaches, which again, if we're in the Chilterns, we probably would want to conserve, but um, I'm not sure that SNH in North Scotland actually wants to keep these, uh, which is where the, the photograph is taken. And on the left is what is a pretty good example in many respects of bog woodland. And if that was in Central Europe, probably be protected. It's actually in Northumberland and the pines are uh, invasion over the last couple of hundred years. The, part, the stand has, the bog has had a bit of drainage to it, but that drainage is now blocked. Um, and I think these are some of the habitats that we are probably going to be facing more of in 20, 40, 50 years time. And we've got to think what to do with them. And let's just think, you know, a lot of what we, we do is based on the philosophy of the Nature Conservation Review, which was published in 1977. Our main classification, the NVC, was published in 1990s, but actually is based on fieldwork carried out in the late 70s, early 80s, so 40 odd years old. Has vegetation not changed in that time? And our dear old citations for many of our SSIs that we use to judge whether sites are important or not, or to say about it, does contain some odd things, like the one for Monk's Wood still refers to nightingales, which I don't think have been there for at least 20 years. And yet that is apparently one of the things that Monk's Wood is good for. So we need to remember that the past is a foreign country. We did things differently because the context was different. And um, I rather like this slide of uh, nature reserve no access. Ooh not very PC these days. And the future is also going to be very different to now. And we're going to have to change, I think, the way we do things because the evidence on which we base our assumptions, the way we do conservation has developed since the 1970s and 80s. I want to explore that by just taking a series of ideas, concepts that are central to a lot of woodland conservation, just looking at how that changed, how much things have changed. So let's start with ancient woodland. We go back to the 70s, it was only just becoming accepted as a concept in the conservation sector, let alone in forestry or planning work. There was a strong idea that many ancient woods, not all, but many had continuity with the wildwood. And we didn't actually set out to conserve ancient woods as such. 
George Peterkin's original ideas were that mapping ancient woodlands was a quick way in which we could whittle out a lot of less light, likely important woods. And then we could look to see which of the ancient woods actually were important for conservation. Incidentally, um, I said continuity of the wildwood. Um, George's first paper on uh, what we now call ancient woodland indicators refers to them as primary woodland indicators. So primary woodland species. That's sort of to, to give you this idea that there was this strong thought there. And of course, they, there was no protection for ancient woodland. Jump forward, hmm, how things have changed. Well, continuity with the wildwood um, is, I think, much less likely to, to be true for ancient, most ancient woodlands. Whenever you let an archaeologist into them, they turn up remnants of Iron Age clearances or Roman villas or goodness knows what else. So it looks like most of our ancient woodland is at best ancient secondary. Secondly, we've found that these indicator species colonize much more often than thought. And this is a rather nice example of uh, dogs, mercury and bluebell on what is meant to be, according to the citation of this SSI limestone grassland. And that is what the conservation objectives for this patch of ground here are desperately seeking to do which is why it's now grazed heavily by sheep. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's not been wooded at least for 400 years. Past human influences are much more persuasive in the landscape, I think we would now say, than we would have thought in the 1970s. But interestingly, we've, we've changed subtly the way, the approach to conservation of ancient woodlands in that we're now saying, we conserve them because they are ancient woodland, not because they may be a way of identifying which woods are important. And that protection has been gradually being ramped up and applied to more and more sites um, over as time has gone on. Now, the challenge, I think, is that as the protection has hardened, it reinforces the idea of a binary division between ancient and recent woodland. At the same time as the research is saying that it's not strictly binary, it is a spectrum. And that while you can identify somewhere like the top slide there, site in Norfolk, as clearly it is ancient woodland, it's clearly very diverse in terms of its flora and important for conservation. It might be more difficult to justify why the bottom slide, which technically is ancient woodland and was defended at the public inquiry as ancient woodland, quite why that should receive the same level of protection. So how do we nuance the idea that there is a spectrum and that some bits of ancient woodland may actually be, well, not exactly that rich and exciting um, when against the idea that we do actually want to preserve, conserve most of those ancient woodland sites. Now I'll move to a different topic, but a related one. Um, as I said, there was this thought that ancient woods might be related, descended directly from the wildwood. Um, but what did the wildwood look like? Uh, I think when I was an undergraduate, it was probably that it would be mainly closed canopy oak, um, regenerating within the woodland, as in the top slide. Open areas were considered rather limited. And I don't think anyone really thought about large herbivores. During the 70s, there was a developing idea that actually oak was not necessarily the main species, but probably lime, at least through the lowlands. And there were some people arguing for a more open landscape, particularly Francis Lowe is based on 
the occurrence of some large, of um, various large lichens, which appear to be poor colonists. Although there is an element of circularity here in, in some of the arguments that are put forward for poor colonists being indicators of the wildwood in the sense that if they were that poor, they wouldn't have got to Britain. Um, and if you're saying that the poor colonists by definition are what the wildwood was like, then, well, you can't then use them for that. You, you've got no backup as to why that should be the case. Well, what do we think of the wildwood now? Uh, and it's significant because it's often used as a touchstone for some of the ideas about rewilding, which I'm going to come on to later. What's certain is that um, evidence for openness in the landscape have become much more visible through a whole range of different uh, mecha mechanisms, developments in palynology, use of other proxies such as uh, deadwood beetles or uh, snails. And that was developed by Oliver Rackham in a paper on savannah in Europe in 1996, but really hammered home by Franz Vera in his book, Grazing Ecology and Forest History, to the point where he sort of more or less argues that much of at least lowland Northwest Europe was a half open landscape. Actually, he nowhere, to my knowledge, and certainly not in his book, argues as to why it should be half open rather than 10% open or 90% open, but makes the argument that large herbivores drove uh, a shifting mosaic of openness and close. Well, again, there's not a lot of evidence that there necessarily was a shifting mosaic, but it does mean that we've got to think more carefully about what we think about open landscapes and about the role of large herbivores. And it also, we need to bear in mind with that, the role of human influence, which Franz Vera didn't really take into account, I feel, but that certainly was significant because another change over the last couple of decades has been bringing to the fore the, well, first of all, the Paleolithic influence on megafaunal extinction. Basically, we killed the mammoth is the idea, or at least made a substantial uh, contribution to that. And that even within the Holocene and before the advent of farming and the, the Neolithic revolution, that the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were themselves making a significant change to the landscape, burning areas, opening areas to for the development of hunting, so that virtually everything that we look at when we're trying to reconstruct the, the Holocene is in fact looking at a cultural landscape. With, so with humans as part, part of that. And the challenge then for us is that if human influence is so long lasting and so deeply embedded, I suggest that it's very difficult to come up with what you might call a practical natural baseline for conservation. If we, you know, something that natural in the sense of not having a human influence on it. We can't really go back to previous interglacials. We don't know enough about them to be able to say exactly what they look like. We've got some broad generalizations, but not so much more. And the minute we start looking at the Holocene, post-glacial period, then as I say, we've got this human element in there. So to an extent, all interventions that we propose, including not intervening, become value judgments. It can be argued that saying we want to conserve <clears throat> traditional coppice, like the slide on the picture on the right, is a value judgment that, you know, why should we choose that rather than the recent um, 
scrub and woodland development in the middle, or the left hand side, which is a sort of uh, old growth Sitka spruce stand in Northumberland. In a sense, they are all cultural landscapes. And in that sense, to that degree, it is a value judgment as to which we want. And then if enough people want value and alternative, then so be it. And looking at some of the interventions that we have advocated for many years, been a strong person involved, strongly involved with that. Let's let's take one of them, coppicing, which um, is sort of this was very much a mantra of, of daily life in the 70s and 80s. Most much of ancient semi-natural woodland has had a coppice history at some stage or other. And there is this mantra of trying to restore traditional management. And there are good reasons for trying to do that in terms of the species that will benefit. And if we had managed to do that on a large enough scale, perhaps we could have offset some of the species declines which have undoubtedly happened over the last 30 years. And to that end, in 1982, Dick Steele and uh, George Peterkin, the Conference of Foresters, Broadleaves in Britain Conference, proposed and were not shouted down that um, we should aim for about 167,000 hectares, about, uh, about half the ancient semi-natural woodland, um, to go under coppice. That would be 140,000 hectares of restoration, about 27,000 hectares, which was the estimate for what was still in, in cycle at the time. I haven't noticed that happening. Work coppice for the last 40, 50 years has stubbornly stayed at around 20 to 30,000 hectares. It's probably a bit more than that because a lot of it ducks under the radar, but yeah, I don't think it's much more than 40,000 hectares at most. And the reason that, or well, one of the reasons that uh, Peterkin and Steele's proposal rapidly became unfeasible was simply that deer numbers went through the roof in the 1980s and 90s. We'd taken our eye off their population in the 70s, not noticed they were creeping up. And suddenly, coppicing, which hadn't required any sort of protection whatsoever to get it away, and so was could be seen as a cheap way of generating biomass and wood, uh, was no longer cheap because you had to put in a deer fence. And then when we started trying to think about that more, it was clear that a lot of the coppice that we'd been thinking about restoring had already been promoted to high forest. And well, shouldn't we perhaps move to favoring the species of high forest on the grounds that that's what these woods were going to be? We were never going to get our 140,000 hectares coppice restored. Are we still mentally thinking about restoring coppice rather than what is it that high forest can deliver? Now, if coppice was the sort of failure of the last sort of 30 or 40 years in terms of doing large scale restoration, its complement in species terms of wood pasture and veteran trees and on the vet traditional management scale, has sort of really gone the other way. It was barely recognized in the 1970s. Few people like Francis Rose and Paul Harding would have been promoting it and through that report there published in 1986, but based on late 70s surveys. But it's still thought of as mainly a lowland issue. And I don't, there was an I came across an interesting quote from the late 60s referring to Windsor Park, where you can see that um, the person who was sent to ask whether Windsor Forest should become a nature reserve wasn't very impressed. 
NRIC is the uh, Nature Reserve Investigation Committee. No ancient oak wood at all. Who was this guy? Charles Elson, father of ecology, father of animal ecology, a staunch pro proponent of deadwood conservation, but he didn't really rate parklands. Well, now we're, we've, as I say, we've gone almost to the other extreme and um, through things like the Veteran Trees Initiative, the work of the Ancient Tree Forum, there's a much wider recognition that wood pasture has been a, a widespread phenomenon, not just in the lowlands, but in the uplands as well. So this wood, which in, when I did my phase one survey, I'd probably have classed as um, degenerate woodland that had been cleared, I would now class as, yeah, probably a reasonable, reasonable condition wood pasture. Which throws us into this question, what are we trying to conserve? Are we trying to conserve cultural practices such as wood pasture and coppice or the wildlife associated with them? And if so, are we going to do it by trying to restore some of these traditional methods or in totally new ways? And um, the recent interest in the bison in Kent, I think throws us into relief in the sense that they are, the bison are being put into a wood which has not had a wood pasture history for at least 500 years. It's a very well documented coppice woodland, except that it was replanted with um, a mixture of conifers and native broadleaves in the 1960s and 70s. And that's what they want to break up using bison a non-native species, at least for this, this sort of post-glacial period, um, and going into a wood area which hasn't had large grazing animals in it in recent centuries. But probably it will do some quite good stuff for the habitat mosaic. The next topic I'd like to sort of bring up and as an illustrate changes is the idea of landscape ecology and conservation. It didn't really exist in the, in the 1970s. There were some papers about species area curves and trying to see whether island biogeography could be applied to patches of habitat on, on land, but they were in hindsight rather simplistic. Um, there's a quite an infamous diagram down on the left of uh, ideas for nature reserve design, which is better and better is worse. And uh, you know, we need to nuance that quite a lot. Um, and the abstract is from an early paper on birds uh, and woodland size. And it's often used ultimately as the basis for saying that great spotted woodpeckers need quite a large area, even though they actually will use lots of small patches. And even if we wanted to think about landscape ecology, there were no agro-environment schemes to, that we could use to apply it. Well, now there is AALI, which didn't exist. Um, agro-environment schemes have sort of promulgated, have been, become abundant. Technological changes, just the fact that you can use drones and satellite imagery to analyze and assess a whole landscape um, makes a hell of a difference to whether you can actually do landscape ecology. Lots of connectivity mapping, and it's even got up to the high political levels through things like the Lawton Port. And the challenge is, it seems to me still, how do we translate those models into practice and make them relevant to individual landowners? And um, so that they will make the changes. And is it how is it worth it the extra cost of for targeting um, and the effort involved in targeting to compared to just leaving it to those landowners? Um, it seems likely it is, but we we've, we've not got a lot of evidence to prove that yet. 
And I mentioned I was going to talk a bit about rewilding. Well, yeah, again, the term did not exist in, in its current usage in the 1970s, although there were equivalent sort of ideas of minimum intervention reserves, which were mainly small scale woodland, Lady Park Wood, as in the top slide, or areas that were left alone after storm damage. Um, so and there's a, one slide in the bottom there is a notice saying this area has been left alone from about 1991 and more or less the same same notice is still there in 2017 but the wood has changed and the difference with the way we've gone with rewilding is that it's a much larger scale leaving things to nature than compared to just small minimum intervention woods there's much it's actually much more interventionist so it involves generally involves trying to reintroduce lost processes or reintroduce species um, it's fairly plastic terms which is strength in my view because it allows you to see it as a spectrum of activities rather than a necessarily an end point where you're going to reintroduce the wolf um, which tends to frighten people so that we can have things like the nep estate where in a way it's just extensive farming remain rather unpredictable there are going to be losses in rewilding areas as well as gains there's often a need for startup works which can be quite expensive so it's still another form of cultural landscape and what I don't think we've faced yet is what we're going to do with non-native species which um, thrive within uh, some rewilding areas. Uh, what we're going to do with um, places where a native species, bottom left is holly, sort of trying to engulf this lovely old oak veteran. Well, that could easily happen on some rewilding sites. Do you then intervene or not? And another area, you know, if we're going down one hand, we're going down a rewilding route and saying we should intervene less. On the other hand, we're also intervening more in that in the 1970s, we'd hardly think about introducing species for conservation purposes, creating new habitat. Whereas uh, meadow species introductions are now a regular part of agri-environment schemes, woodland ground flora species are starting to happen, people are talking about assisted migration. Which brings me towards the end, what are our conservation objectives going to be for 2050? We can't just go back to the 1970s and say that these habitats and these species assemblages are what we're going to expect to conserve in 2050. Um, our classification by that stage will be even even more out of date. So which introductions are going to be part of new landscapes? Which are going to remain beyond the pale? I'm, I'm not prepared to accept rhododendron, so I don't want that. But home oak, yeah, I think it probably does have a place. And is conservation being bold enough? And are we looking at landscapes in the right way? So if you look at the top slide, which is Kielder, there's some nice natural regeneration happening and there's some planting. Ignore the bit at the back. The natural regeneration is the spruce. Um, the planting is oak. If we want more native natural conditions which is the more natural a non-native species but doing it process as it would in its natural boggy habitat in Alaska or planting oak on a somewhat dubious site I would think wetness um, of knows what origin I think we've got to think about what patterns of land use we're going to need. We can't assume that we are going to get as much land as we want for conservation, so the rest species are going to have to be maintained 
in the rest of the landscape, which will have to be managed for production, either of food or fibre. And we may need to accept that some species are going to be lost. And I think we should be thinking about that now so that we don't continually fight rearguard actions to maintain something and then it you know, which, which realistically can't. And to leave you with a thought, when you look at the bottom right picture, what do you see? You see a road and you probably mean, oh God, horrible motorway fragmenting the landscape. But if you look at the left of the picture, it's scrub. It's a highway of scrub going through what is actually a, an arable landscape. It's part of Norfolk. And we, I was at another meeting this morning where people were lamenting the lack of scrub in Oxfordshire. And I don't suppose they counted up the area of roadside scrub in any of their thinking. So, there are some it, ideas that you can now, as the parents of conservation, yeah, you've got to deal with or to throw away. But I've thrown them out there. But it seems to me that we want more people like Bob who looked at the evidence rigorously and tried to follow it through logically, no matter how heretical at times it appeared. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, thanks for the, your really um, honest and um, really interesting and thought provoking um, ideas and reflections um, from your great knowledge and experience. I think there's quite a lot to chew over and I, thought, I think it's also going to prompt some lively discussion and debate. Um, so please, uh, can everyone keep submitting questions to Keith and to everyone um, in the panel? Um, using the, the chat box function. Um, we're now going to hear from each of our uh, discussion panel members and they're going to briefly respond to Keith's talk. Um, so first up, uh, we have Emma Goldberg uh, from Natural England. Thanks, Chloe, and thanks, Keith, for those really interesting reflections. And we've been asked to um, comment on exciting developments in conservation and challenges as well as responding to Keith's presentation. And I'm going to start off somewhat unusually for me, um, uh, outlining that I think we're, I'm recognizing that we're living in quite an exciting policy sphere. And that was not a sentence that I ever thought I would hear myself say, um, but we are now um, under the England's Tree Action Plan in England, and we have huge targets to deliver for new woodland, and that is exciting. And that's across the whole woodland spectrum of all different types and fast growing species will be welcomed to sequester carbon rapidly. And in the midst of COP27, that is hardly something I can take issue with. However, the messages from COP26 are still ringing in my ears. We're in a climate and nature crisis and both must be addressed. And with our, within our nature recovery targets, then some native woodland will be a part of this picture. So to draw on Keith's presentation, uh, particularly regarding ancient woodland, which I bristled somewhat when uh, <laughs> when I read his slides. I'm much calmer now, Keith. Um, <laughs> I, I thought I'd like to present my own perspective on this because in terms of exciting developments, I do regard the, uh, the um, upkeep of the ancient woodland inventory as a, both in terms of policy and practice, as hugely exciting. And although Keith challenges us on the binary nature, apparently ancient woodland good, recent woodland, well, I won't say bad, but not as good, uh, then I, I still regard it as a huge win for us that ancient woodland is receiving protection. Um, and the re revision of the keepers of time, yes, it may create that artificial boundary, uh, one which I think was recognized to an extent in the creation of the ancient woodland inventory. It made it easier for the, uh, the assumption to be made that it was going to be of greater interest. It does not confer, it, but it does confer protection on ancient woodlands. So our challenge is to find and recognize recent woodlands of high value and maybe create them and then implement policy to protect them too. Keepers of Time also strengthens the definition of ancient woodlands, including for the first time, as Keith highlights and recognizes, the rise and rise of the wood pasture 
because ancient wood pasture and parkland is also now included in Keepers of Time. So the re revision of the ancient woodland inventory will not just encompass small woodlands, but also will take in those new areas, or not new areas, but new to the, new to the inventory areas, uh, of uh, mosaics of open grown trees, scrub and open space. It also recognised the benefits of removing infill from wood pasture and parkland sites. Excitingly, Forestry England have committed to a programme of restoring 6,000 hectares of forestry to less managed land, some of which will be grazed. Sites like Deer Park, Castle Hill and Windy Pits out, outside Helmsley will hugely benefit. It's an exciting project and it will significantly address across the sector, demonstrating and lending legitimacy to this type of woodland management. And small woodland, ancient woodland sites may seem trivial and may appear less likely to have significant bio biological diversity, but in terms of nature recovery, I would argue that they offer connectivity across the landscape and may be an important building block there. Also in consideration of coppice, the decline of which I have considered unworried about over the course of my career, an additional point that Keith did not make, and one reason that I'm somewhat more willing to accept its, its demise, or at least its lack of return to full scale, is that even if we were to restore 167,000 hectares of coppers, uh, because of the increasingly intensive management going on outside the woodland, would we get the desired communities that we seek? So nature recovery of woodlands may depend heavily on activities going on outside of woodlands as well as inside, and the threat of change to woodland communities may be equally, valuable, equally relevant to high forest. And then I was going to talk about uh, adding adding uh, woodland specialist species to new creation, but Keith rather aptly covered that without telling me he was going to do that. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, so, but it, I was going to say that in, I, we attended a workshop, both Keith and I, a few, a few months ago now, uh, about um, including uh, woodland specialists in creating new woodlands. And I felt in some senses that we're really rather lagging behind open habitats in that respect, who have been using seed sources to create and restore open habitats for many decades. So finally, I, I wanted to touch on rewilding and I find using a more process-led ecology is very exciting for two reasons. I think that it allows and encourages dynamism and I really um, do feel that um, point that Keith made about constraining individual habitats. Uh, I'm sitting in the Quantox at the moment, which is designated for oak woodland uh, but in a, in, a, in a context of about 500 hectares of oak woodland in a context of 2,000 hectares of, of heathland, the oak woodland is not regenerating at all, but the woodland's re regenerating perfectly happily in the lowland heathland. It's a little bit of a conundrum when both are designated specifically for those habitats. So allowing things to happen, to ha happen naturally, it's got to have some, pos some positives but also by allowing nature to happen slowly and not assuming that closed canopy woodland is the desired endpoint to be reached as fast as possible, but the journey to get there, if indeed that is the destination, is itself positive. So the scale of some schemes is exciting and it speaks to my earlier point about nature recovery outside of woodland. And one of those processes, one of those natural processes that I found particularly exciting is natural regeneration and natural colonization. And even accepting the challenges of deer management and the possibility of restricted movement and distribution of seeds. One of my great excitements is understanding genetics of natural selection a great deal better, owing to having to sit through many genetics meetings about ash dieback over the past 10 years. Now, ecological geneticists assured me at the outset of the outbreak of ash dieback that natural selection could find resistance to this disease if the regeneration can survive the ravages of deer. And not just that, geneticists also confirm that selection can and will take place on a variety of stresses that woodlands face, such as temperature change, drought, wet winters and storms. And I think that we ignore this at our peril. Keith gave us a quote from L.P. Hartley as the go-between, the pastors of foreign country. And I'd like to leave you one with one from the Bard. There is more on under heaven and earth, Horatio, than is dreamed of by our philosophy. Brilliant. Thank you, Emery. Managed to pack in a lot there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to uh, move on um, so there'll be a chance to ask all of the panel members and Keith questions at the end. So I'm just going to move on now to um, Kirsty Park um, from the University of Stirling. So, um, and she has a couple of slides which Vanessa is going to load. 
So Kirsty. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think Keith covered really well what I see as some of the more exciting or um, important developments um, over the last few decades. I'm, I'm gonna touch on and expand on a, a couple um, that may be more recent. And I think the first is the advance in technological tools. Um, so Keith mentioned this uh, right at the very beginning when he was talking about um, surveying on, on his moped uh, with binoculars and, and obviously the limitations that that, that that brings when you're trying to survey um, habitats and, and the, the, the kind of tools that we now have at our disposal that make data collection on habitats and species more accessible and really importantly more uh, possible to collect at scale. Um, than ever before. So I think that this, this shouldn't ever come at the expense of on the ground field work. I don't think we, um, any of us um, want to turn into just doing our research from, from computers. So on the ground field work, I think remains really important, but it means that we're able to address questions that we couldn't possibly um, have addressed before. So I think it complements um, uh, the kind of data that you can collect um, through field work. So the picture at the bottom of that slide is um, a LIDAR image. It shows the internal structure uh, of woodland. Um, you don't even necessarily have to have the equipment or, or the, the training to, to carry out um, LIDAR surveys um, yourself. Some of these data are, are publicly available and it means that we can now map woodlands and map what the internal structure is it, it, in a way that simply wasn't possible uh, before. And then, and then my bias, I guess, is another new development I find particularly exciting is for species which are hard to survey but acoustically active. So a lot of my research, um, at least certainly in the past, has focused on bats. Um, there are now uh, really low cost acoustic detectors which enable you to record entire soundscapes, not just of bats, but, but of any um, organism that, that's, um, that's making a sound. And that means that we can um, we can survey soundscapes over large areas and potentially over long temporal scales. Uh, again, in a in a way that we, we simply couldn't have done before. The second development that I find really heartening, but with some caveats, is is the, the fact that in the kind of public and political discourse, um, there's been a huge surge in the recognition that. The UK has a pitifully low woodland cover and, and this has consequences, not, not just for the biodiversity in those woodlands, but for us in terms of ecosystem services, flood prevention, climate change mitigation. So, so I think all of that is really good to see, but it, it has sometimes come at the expense of um, this a simplistic assumption uh, that we can just plant woodland anywhere. Um, you know, there are other habitats which are important for, other, uh, for biodiversity and they have also suffered really catastrophic declines. I'm thinking of species rich grasslands here. There are other habitats which are arguably more important for climate uh, carbon storage. So, so thinking of, about peatland. So I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that um, there's, there's a recognition that we need more woodland, however we get it, but it can't come at the expense of, of, of our other important natural or semi-natural um, habitats. If we move on to the next slide, Vanessa. Thanks. So, so looking to the to the second thing we were asked to reflect on um, and, and looking at what's needed, I, I guess my short answer is everything listed on Keith's last slide. Um, I think we need a better understanding of what we're trying to do with woodland expansion and how we can get there. And I think that's really nicely summarized in the, the, the picture on the right hand side is a, a study of, of one woodland vision by Vanessa Burton um, and colleagues um, in a paper a few years ago. So just a, a couple of points in, in relation to this. Um, I can't remember, you might need to use custom animated. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, so there's been quite a lot of discussion in the past few years and, and Emma picked up on this as well about the, the relative merits of planting woodland versus natural colonization and, and letting trees colonize air, um, areas um, by themselves. So which is more effective? How do the result, 
woodlands differ. Um, and I know that forest research is doing quite a lot of work on this at the moment. And there is a new collaborative treescapes project, which is being led by my colleague, um, Elisa Fuentes Montemayor um, at Sterling. So we're, we're going to be looking at, at this question um, over the next couple of years. Keith also pointed to the lack of a natural baseline. Um, and so obviously traditionally in restoration, we're, we're trying to judge the success or otherwise of, of restoration actions by comparison with a reference site. And as he highlighted, there are really big problems um, with this approach. Um, so I'm just apologies for flagging my own research here, but, but myself, if you're interested, myself and colleagues are investigating um, ecological complexity rather than species identity as an alternative goal in restoration. This is in a project called Restoring Resilient um, Ecosystems and, and the, the paper up there, which is open access, um, is some of we've explored um, some of these ideas um, in that paper that was published last year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and one example from another project I'm involved with, uh, the REM project. So this uses a chrono sequence of secondary woodlands so between about 20, 160 years old, which we've mapped using historic um, land use maps. Um, we're examining the biodiversity responses to woodland creation. And we've also compared a subset of those sites to ancient woodlands. Um, so, so we survey quite a large range of different plants and animal species, but I'm just um, flagging up the, the results from the moths um, that we surveyed. So we found that moth species richness was actually quite similar in secondary and ancient woodlands in the same landscapes. The moth communities in secondary woodlands were somewhat different to those in ancient woodlands, but they're not a subset. They're not simply a subset. They're not on a trajectory to become what a moth community in an ancient woodland uh, looks like. So, so it indicates that if we want to conserve habitat for, say, a maximum, the maximum number of, of moth species, there is a need to, to conserve both secondary and ancient woodlands. Um, that paper is published in Diversity and Distributions, and it's also open access. And then last slide, please, Vanessa. And then just finally, one of the key challenges which, which Keith and Emma both picked up on it is one thing to set ambitious woodland expansion targets, whether it's through planting or natural colonisation. It's a very different matter to meet them. So we need to, you know, most of Britain is not owned, most of the UK is owned by private landowners. If we want them to have more woodland on their land, we need to understand their motivations better. Um, we need to understand the finances better and we need to understand the implications for um, other land uses. Um, by having uh, the woodland expansion. So, and, I, and there is quite a diversity of, of different projects, some of them funded through the Treescapes um, programme by a, a whole range of, of different organisations. So yeah, exciting things to come, I hope. Thank you, that's me. Great, thank you very much, Kirsty. And then I'm just gonna move on now to Jim Latham from Natural Resources Wales. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you, Keith, for a, you know, a memorable and thought provoking talk as ever. Um, certainly quite a challenge to uh, summarize <laughs> very much of it in, in a short space of time. So I'm just going to pick on a, a couple of themes that uh, really sort of um, emerged for me from it. Um, and the first of that is around uh, what is natural and how um, perceptions have changed about this over, over the years. And this is something that came out in Keith's talk in, well, throughout really, in terms of uh, talking about coppice, ancient woodland, uh, large herbivore grazing, rewilding. Um, this idea of naturalness is, is sort of central. Um, and we're much more aware now of the profound influence that humans have on our woodlands in sort of every respect. And also this idea that the uh, we don't really have a baseline that um, the human influence goes right back to the time, well, post-glacial times, and, Arguably, we didn't have woodlands. People were here before the woodlands were. Um, so the question perhaps we used to ask quite a lot, when was natural, really doesn't mean so much anymore. But I would suggest that despite that, we can still recognize ele elements of naturalness in terms of woodland structure, processes, composition and scale. And those elements still um, are valid as a basis for considering conservation value of our woodlands. 
Uh, the second theme I just want to pick up, which is very nice, is around landscape ecology and um, something, you know, obviously we worked uh, quite a lot on in Wales. Um, and going back 25 or 30 years, when I was sort of first involved in this, uh, this area of work, we'd have a lot of discussions about basically how do you consider fragments of woodland in a landscape before considering a new protected site? How far apart do the bits of woodland have to be to be considered the site? Effectively, how big is a woodland in a functional sense? And we had no objective way of doing that. So we were lucky enough to be able to embark on a, a program of um, uh, modelling and mapping of uh, habitat networks for woodlands across Wales. And this was a, a wonderful association of people, really. We were able to utilise forest researchers' uh, um, least cost modelling under their beetle uh, toolkit, uh, combined with the phase one um, habitat survey we had comprehensively across all of Wales, newly digitised and very nice. So it's about 20 years ago we embarked on this. And we were able to, to model and map um, woodland habitat networks across the whole of Wales in, in great detail. And it's really proved a wonderful resource and widely used. Uh, for example, in terms of defining sites, so no longer are we just sort of guessing as to the, the likely connectedness of, of fragments in the landscape, we can start to really objectively say what bits should go into a, into a, a protected site. Um, they've had influence on um, grant schemes for woodland creation and for targeting uh, woodland habitat management and for identifying the best areas for pause restoration, so that they're widely used. And we didn't stop with woodlands. We were able to expand this, this work to um, map the equivalent networks for grasslands, heathlands, fens, bogs and sand dunes to build up a really thorough, large um, understanding, really, or, or description of likely connectivity of the main habitats across Wales. Uh, so those maps have been there for quite some time, but they've been given a greater prominence. This is the exciting bit, perhaps, to, to talk about exciting developments um, as we go along. Um, we have a new initiative in Wales uh, called ne uh, Nature Networks, which will ring a bell with many people. Um, it's a part of the response to uh, the, the nature crises that are going on. Um, and based around our protected sites, recognising them as key areas for biodiversity and uh, for nature recovery and trying to move them away from being islands in a landscape to functionally connected uh, series of core biodiversity areas that are well managed in good condition. So it's echoing the, the, uh, the, the Lawton report and the, the uh, um, suggestions there and the recommendations for these large scale habitat networks. Um, we've been talking about this sort of work for a long time, but the difference is now we've actually got substantial money from Welsh government to, to push this forward. Um, we, uh, we, we've got uh, uh, funding now for three years as well, which is still short, but it's enough time to start getting some really exciting work off the ground. So finally, just to think a bit about the future, um, Keith outlined a lot of uncertainties, things we don't know about the future, which is certainly cause for concern, and we need to think about that a lot. But I would suggest that one trend we're going to continue to see is that of integration. Uh, we're seeing it uh, within woodlands in terms of not just looking at woods in isolation, but looking at series or networks of sites uh, and integration across different habitats as well. So we're looking at networks for a, a, a range of um, semi-natural habitats and integration with people, recognising that uh, there are so, so many societal benefits that woodlands provide. We need to be considering that, I suggest, in the future, in the way we conserve woodlands. So it's we're actually providing across these these different services. Um, so I'll finish there. So it's cause for concerns for the future, but I'd, I'd also suggest, suggest some causes for optimism. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and finally, we're going to move on to Nina Schonberg uh, from the Northern Ireland Landscape Partnership. Thanks, Chloe, and thanks really for putting me last, because I would like to think that what I'm going to say hopefully follows quite nicely, um, especially what Jim just said uh, in terms of kind of network mapping and, and, and nature networks, because that's really been the focus of, of my work specifically. So I thought I would really kind of set the scene, I guess, for Northern Ireland, considering that um, we like to do things a little bit differently over here. And I guess you will probably learn that we are probably lacking behind um, in many respects on, on even talking about nature networks um, as a whole. So in terms of Northern Ireland and woodlands in Northern Ireland specifically, 
uh, obviously we've made references to the low woodland cover uh, across the UK. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we are looking at something like 9%, which is obviously still a lot lower than and the UK average, which is 13, and even um, lower than the Rep Republic of Ireland at 11%. And e even further, looking at Asian woodlands specifically, out of that 9%, uh, Asian woodlands only take up about 0.04% of the landscape in Northern Ireland. Um, and obviously they are considered the, the kind of richest and most complex terrestrial habitats and probably hold most of the threatened species in Northern Ireland as well. So that kind of puts into the context of, of, of where we're at, which is about 12th worst in the world for biodiversity loss. Uh, based on recent um, research. In terms of climate change um, and the role of woodlands in that conversation, it was only earlier this year that the Climate Change Committee actually advised our dear minister that we basically need to increase our afforestation rates to up to kind of tenfold compared to where we are now at the moment. And that would bring us up to sort of 2,500 hectares per year by 30, 2035. So in, in terms of woodland planting, our progress has been really quite low and slow, I guess you would, you would say. Um, and I guess more specifically, looking back at Pete's presentation and, and what Jim just said, and specifically references that have been made to, to the Lawton report and, and the recommendations as, as part of that, um, we've been working at the Landscape Partnership, so the Landscape Partnership being the Wildlife Trusts, um, Woodland Trust, National Trust, and RSBB, um, on basically building capacity around nature networks or nature recovery networks for the last couple of years. And this has, in fact, produced these habitat network maps uh, for Northern Ireland now, which Jim referred to for Wales as well. And following from this, um, Woodland Trust actually is has now commissioned a piece of work looking at woodland opportunity maps specifically for Northern Ireland. And in terms of the kind of outputs that we are looking at as part of this, we are looking at having opportunity maps for the whole of Northern Ireland, but also for all of our 11 council areas, um, accompanied by a set of woodland cover targets for the next three sort of decades. Uh, and obviously these are looking at, you know, uh, objectives both for climate and biodiversity. In terms of, I guess, the most exciting recent developments, I would selfishly like to argue that the fact that we now have these national habitat network maps is a huge development. Um, we've obviously really lagged behind, um, considering that Wales has just explained how in Wales we've had these for, for sort of 20 years. Um, the fact also that we've now got uh, climate change legislation in Northern Ireland, I think it's really big, considering that we used to be, until earlier this year, the last country in Europe, I believe, that didn't have any legislation for climate change. And obviously this can provide us a bit of a direction of travel, considering the provisions for nature-based solutions as part of this. Um, and specific for woodlands, uh, we've also had um, the DERA Forest for Our Future scheme, which has been running for the last couple of years. And this has had the ambition of, of planting 9,000 hectares of new woodland by 2030. So that would be around 900 hectares per year. Um, in terms of, I guess, ex exciting developments on the ground, I guess um, a nice example of that would be the woodlands Woodland Trust's work at um, Morn Park, which is at the bottom of the Morn Mountains in County Down. And basically they took over this site, which includes 73 hectares of ancient woodland. And this is quite a massive piece of land and a massive piece of land in terms of ancient woodland in particular, considering that our average tends to be around two hectares. So the fact that this area can be has been secured and, and is being restored at the moment is, is significant and, and really brilliant news. And just to move on quickly in terms of what I would like to see happen, uh, and again, kind of reflecting on Keith's presentation really and what everybody else has been saying, um, 
if we really want to make this kind of different difference for biodiversity and climate as well at scale, we really in Northern Ireland in particular need to figure out how we translate these models and these maps into policy and also into practice. And like uh, has been said already, you know, we need to make this kind of schemes attractive and meaningful for people and landowners in particular. So for Northern Ireland in particular, we really need to define, you know, what the true roles and what the guidance, guidance might look like for concepts like rewilding, because that hasn't really happened at all. And likewise for nature-based solutions. And also, you know, what are the needs for us of our species is in this whole conversation. Um, we also really need to understand the vulnerability of our habitats and our habitat networks and our potential actions as well to climate change, which is actually something that we're looking at as a partnership at the moment. But um, ironically, um, in the context of uh, lacking an executive in Northern Ireland, um, we do have some major legislative gaps that really need to be filled. Specifically, I personally would like to see, you know, nature restoration legislation um, in existence in Northern Ireland, as, especially to, to bring that up to the same level as our ambitions for climate change, to make sure, obviously, that these those two conversations are, are happening in tandem. And as part of this, you know, a land use strategy and, and ambitious targets um, in our biodiversity strategy are really, really important. And specifically, I would like to see this sort of nature network principles of more, bigger, better, more connected, but the right thing in the right places um, kind of guide um, those sort of strategies and ambitions. And just lastly, more specifically for woodlands, and I know I've talked about more than woodlands here, um, we do really need a forestry strategy for Northern Ireland or a trees and woods strategy because um, the last one we had was published back in 2006 and uh, and like we've just heard even from from Keith you know the thinking really has moved on from from even 15 years ago and obviously these really need to have targets for woodland creation so that we can kind of reach the, that ambition um, of the CCC recommendations and obviously that's where the Woodland Trust's current work could really become really important. Um, and lastly as well, and this is referred to by others as well, um, you know, if we talk about planting and planting in appropriate places and in appropriate ways, the sourcing of the trees is really important as well. And uh, obviously they need to be sourced locally and, and grown locally. So there really needs to be more support on that and, and resources um, in terms of establishing tree nurseries uh, to assist in that whole process. So I think that's me and obviously happy to answer questions. And I know potentially one of my colleagues, Paul, might have shared some links um, in the chat as well. And I'm sure he will be able to pick up on uh, any tricky questions that I might not be able to answer. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Nina. And thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, I think your input was really lovely and varied and exciting and interesting. And it's brilliant to get the perspectives from all around the UK. Um, and now it